Yes, this is Let's Talk Radical Radio, getting to the root causes of the important issues of the day. This on-the-air community forum believes your voice matters and welcomes all thoughts and views without judgment. Please join today's conversation by calling 415-663-8492 or tweet us at at Let's Talk on KWMR. Your host today are Paul Raphael leading our conversation. Robin Carpenter answering the phones, and I'm Mary Frank. When you call in and hear the phone ringing, please hang on. When you hear me say you're on the air, please give us your first name, turn down your radio, and please watch your language. Yes, watch your language. Make it English at all times, please. (laughs) That's Uh, the American way. (laughs) The American American. Uh, Today, we are talking about optimism because, you know, there are so many dire things going on. I thought it was, I thought it would be a nice idea to find out where resilience comes from, where your hope, hopefulness comes from in the face of all the horrible news that we're hearing. And, you know, is it as bad as... It has been in the past. Who knows? But right now it feels like there are several, many insurmountable problems happening in the world. And uh, I don't know. I'm just curious as to how people carry on, how they find the optimism, the hopefulness to... uh, to think that the future is going to be brighter than it is now. Especially, I'm really curious to hear from people who have children and uh, are still having children in the face of terrible things because that must mean that you're optimistic. Well, (laughs) as my husband calls me, apocalypto girl, um, you you know, I think it's really interesting we had a great email which paul you might share from um, murray seward mm-hmm. who is always first of all one of our favorite listeners and um very thoughtful in in how he sees doing things and um it reminds me of one of my favorite movie, movies is year of living dangerously and in that movie there's the little uh i can't remember the woman's name the actress but she's playing billy the uh photojournalist right. And um, and what one of the because this movie is very much about despair in the face of terrible in, insurmountable sort of corruption and horrible things happening, and he basically says, you know, do the thing the closest to you, the kindest, most impactful thing closest to you. So he was helping a young single mother, you know, with her child who does end up dying and getting it to the doctor. But that if everybody did within their own circle, mm. all the kind and the most kind and compassionate and helpful things they can do, if we're all doing that, mm. then we don't have to come up and see it as some ginormous global action we must make happen. Mm. I think it's also a personal choice and where your talents lie. Mm. Um, I think you need both. I need think you need the global visionaries like a Paul Hawken, and you need people doing the daily acts. And, and in terms of the daily acts, it's like a quantum field. If you get enough people doing the right thing, there is another huge, giant shift like what happened in the 60s. So I think you need both. Mm. So you need uh, you need active mindfulness, if you like. You have to uh, put out positive vibes. Well, if enough does people begin- are doing positive vibe things, then it'll happen. And, and instead of being competitive, you're being <clears throat> collaborative, uh, collaborative, empathetic. You're in making, service. You're making your little ripples go out. Uh, in a good way, you're helping people that need help around you, or you're doing things locally that need help. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, Murray said, um, focus on the things you can do that make a difference in your world, even if that consists only of you. Uh, When he's working on creative projects, he's alive and hopeful. Uh, And even and he says, even when he's fixing the sink, he's uh, he's feeling he's feeling optimistic. He's having a better time of it because of his effort in doing something that he can fix. The sure prescription for despair is filling one's life up with dire events of the sort that we can do nothing about. Uh, we can. There are dire events close to home. We are. We or our friends or family members can get sick. No escape from death. But dealing with dire events close to home gives us a chance to practice our humanity and use our skills. Humor, comforting whatsoever. Uh, don't just think local. Be local. 
even when the skies are cloudy, life will seem better than any alternative. Well, there you are. So that's the, that's the hanging on for dear life thing as well, right? I mean, that's an instinctive thing that as long as your heart is beating and your brain is working and you're breathing, that you're not going to give up. You're going to clutch at straws. I mean, that's, and you also that's have a better sort of life. In, in, inbuilt optimism right there. You, yeah. it, life is the most important thing. Right? And, and so is the present moment. You know, you have to... Right. If that if that is in harmony with the good stuff, your life is in harmony with the good stuff, you know. Right. But that doesn't mean the uh, Pollyanna, you know, everything's fine, everything's good, like Norman Vincent Peale or uh, what's his name, Tony <laughs> Robbins, or all those well, sort of the guy that burns your feet. <laughs> Hi, yes, you want to go? Uh, you you must smile because everything's going to be fine. All you have to do is is think about it nicely, and you don't have to do anything. Healthy optimism, blah blah blah, uh, is. Uh, that everything will be fine. You can you can make uh, smiling in the face of tragedy, all that sort of stuff. I, you know. Well, I think it's interesting because you asked about um, for people who have children or are having children, and we in our community we've had a lot of gorgeous, darling babies the past couple of years, yeah, yeah. and um, and I have a son. He's twenty eight. And I think that I was thinking about, um, so Mary and I knew each other when my son was very young, and when being a single mom, and you're just running, running, rushing, rushing, but that also, for me, it was your priorities shift when, you're, when you have a child, so you're still doing the local, local in terms of, for me, what I tried to do was really focus on how involved I was at his school, with his friends. Uh, uh, becoming as close as I could to as many of the parents so that we were a little village and we were very fortunate because he was in a small um, private school in the city where it was progressive and we were all like-minded. So we did bigger things. We talked with the kids about things like prejudice and racism Mm -hmm. and and the uh, you know, the ecology and what was happening to the planet, but we also made sure that you know we were making tie dyed soccer uniforms together sure. and baking brownies. And so I think it is that mix that was probably the happiest time in his life and my life when we had that period of time. Sure, when you're building a character who will have his own life later on, when you're yeah. giving him education and and skills and. But there was the, you know, I really did feel, I remember when I was pregnant, I used to walk the Tennessee Valley Trail all the time. And I would think about, I felt very frightened of bringing a child into the world as I saw it, because Mm. I'd been working on, you know, environmental issues and things of that nature, Mm. you know, for most of my 20s. And uh, and just it really hit me as my pregnancy progressed. And I remember I was about a week late and my midwife saying, you are afraid to bring him out in the world. I said, yeah, as long as he's in uh, here, <laughs> I can eat all organic food and I can keep him totally <laughs> safe. And, you know, and, and I said, I wish it was like an elephant where you could, you know, be pregnant for two years. Cause I just, you know, I really realized I had a lot of fear yeah. Yeah. and, you know, um, but that you have to just soldier well, on. Sooner or later, he had to come out. <laughs> yeah, my midwife was like, <laughs> "You said you wanted a, a natural childbirth, now you or whatever." Are. Now yeah. you're an optimist. Congratulations. Here's the baby. But no, I, but I do remember that uh, feeling, and I wonder if young moms today probably have that same feeling too. I'm bringing my child into this world, and then they're how also. Can you, how can you protect them from the world? And and how. Or and how do you prepare and how do you apologize to, to them resilient. that it, it's not as great as it should be? Right. But but I think having a child is great optimism. But we also have mm-hmm. young women in our community who are fabulous, like Rebecca Burgess, founder mm. of the Fibership Project, one mm-hmm. of those optimistic people I know. And Rebecca's chosen not to have children mm-hmm. because she wants to channel all of her creative and loving energy into this her particular vision and calling mm-hmm. around you know how well, we, you, and if, her, her, if, what her project is is a fiber shed. Yeah, where she's uh, changing. Are you familiar with it, Paul? Where she's changing how people see dyes and clothing, hmm. and the contribution she's making is extraordinary in terms of she's making natural fiber dye. products. So basically, what she did, she's oh, yeah. creating. She's actually created a system that's being adopted around the world. Yeah, uh, and acknowledging, she started right here. Yeah. So she started here with the Fiber Shed Project, which was a one-year mm-hmm. project that she would only wear clothing. 
where everything came from within a hundred mile radius and everything was knitted or sewn or made for her and the fabric woven by people locally and it and was the, a, and the and dyes a, natural okay. nice. so let me finish nice. Sorry. <laughs> and so what happened during that project <laughs> is she had to wait for the women to like it got cold we had a cold snap in the fall and somebody hadn't knitted her socks yet mm-hmm. and so she she lived through really sensing about our clothing, there was so much focus on our food, but also she right. saw, you know, the number two polluter of water, oceans and waters in the world are from uh, fabric dyes. Mm. So that became her passion. Excellent. And, um, and the dyes, especially, were like from even Levi's, you know, the Levi James, yeah. the blue dye Indigo, was so toxic. Yeah. Yeah. I met, I was going to do a show on Rebecca, and mm-hmm. I met her. She said, well, can you meet me in the fields above Nicasio and blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. And she's literally out there picking the yellow flowers for the yellow dye. Wonderful. And she's done wonderful work. But, the, uh, but if you do anything, right, if you have any anything. creative project, you have to be optimistic about it. Otherwise, why would you do why it? Would you do it well I, I said like oh I was gonna say one of the things that's interesting about Rebecca is she was doing something very focused locally but then she she realized because she immersed herself into it mm. that there was not the actual manufacturing and uh, distribution and sales models that all fit together with a mill and all these pieces mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so she started working with engineers and uh, all kinds of people to develop basically a prototype that is mm. now being adopted all over the world Fantastic. from this one little project here with several ladies in our community and other people knitting and you know doing these things for her so i think that's interesting too to see how something that was really to her a passion she wanted to explore locally Mm. um went and i don't think she would have minded if it didn't become but it went international Mm -hmm. and has is having a is having a great impact so i think too if you do what's right in your own backyard as marie says it it'll in some ways too that concept if you do the right thing the next right thing the next good thing Mm. that wherever you're supposed to fit into the picture of things you'll be there right and there's the uh it's that thing about it combined optimism should be a catalyst it can't just you can't just be hopeful for the future and not do anything you have to it's it when you combine it with risk taking or doing something like as she did she was taking a risk in devoting herself completely to something and wearing the that same never thing been over and over. Before, you know, well, not <laughs> and, for centuries, anyway. You know, this is what I find so fascinating about Paul Hawkins' work because he has woven together all the, uh, not all, but most of the projects around the globe and made people aware of each other. Well, uh, you know, and his mm. books on biomimicry and Blessed Unrest right. uh, and Ecology of Commerce have linked and and um, what he joined all these forces. And his new project, which is called Project uh, Drawdown, I'm just going to quote him here. And he said, after his own experiences feeling depressed and negative when reading climate science research, he had a very simple question of his own. Can we just make a list of what we can do now and then measure out its impact? And for years, he's asked people to do it, and no one did it. So he did it. And it's just been extraordinary what Mm. he's been able to achieve because he's coming from the place that business and corporate mentality are the big uh, causes of climate change and Mm. pollution and environmental non-sustainability. So if you go to business and he does by educating them that it, if it's about the bottom line, you've got to consider the fact that this is a something that has to be woven into your fabric because it's not just the bottom line, it's survival. Mm. And his uh, new book is really extraordinary. One of the things he, he uh, projects is that there's not one thing on the list that we wouldn't want to do if climate change did not exist. For everyone makes every single one that he suggests that he's gotten from this group globally makes a better world a healthier and kinder world, a more Mm. resilient agricultural system, more jobs, more prosperity and security. He's kind of uh, taken the 350.org thing as a rejoinder. He's kind of answered that, yes, yes, we can do these things. We've measured these things, and this is what we can do. Mm. I, I recommend the book tremendously. I think he's really done some breakthrough work here. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, and give us a call if you're uh, – let us know what your what your sources of optimism and hope for the future are, 415-663-8492. Yes, this is Let's Talk Radio with host Paul Raffel, Robin Carpenter, and I'm Mary Frank. Again, please call us at 415-663-8492 and tell us your opinions of 
holding optimism in this age. <laughs> and, and tweet us too. I have the tweet box right in front of me. The, it's uh, at Let's Talk on KWMR. Uh, yeah, so, well, there you are. So there's, uh, there's the kind of um, forward-thinking, hopeful, optimistic combined optimism combined with the uh, combined with uh, actually doing stuff doing creative work that uh, you know we always say that was the foundation of America right I mean there were, it was an optimistic country because people came from everywhere else to come here uh, well, the, the other of course, we wiped out most of the indigenous <laughs> no. people while we were in the process of being optimistic. And uh, <laughs> but on a very personal level, you know, if people stay in their creative, loving space, yeah. solutions come up when they do not come up oh. when you're continuously depressed and uh, feeling hopeless. That it is a way of a, a, a gateway uh, to solutions, uh, not only personal but global. It's an energy that when you hold that energy, it allows that higher energy to come in. I mean, I don't want to sound too woo-woo, but in fact, that is, you know, quantum physics. Well, that's interesting. So if you have a if you retain just a positive mindset, don't let things get you down too much, then solutions to problems will present themselves. That's what you're saying? So, oh, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm just, yeah, I'm saying, hmm. but, you know, um, fear is the mind killer. Hmm. And if you stay in that place, all you're going to do is get depressed. Hmm. Whereas if you, it's never called, it's never been more important to be in community, but to first be into community with yourself, because hmm. that's where it comes from. Hmm. And, you know, it's like uh, the first step. So just to speak for the dark side, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think, you know, as someone who has suffered uh, on and off with depression, hmm. um, you know, sometimes in those dark places and and in communing with that sort of dark night of the soul thing, um, learning to balance. I mean, for me, it was always learning to balance um, grief and mourning with joy and optimism that you, that you don't banish one to the other. When I first moved to California, everybody was like, oh, I have to be in the light, Every, the light, the light, the light, the light, the light. Anything dark or depressing, go away, go away, go away. And and I realized you have to find that balance. Like for me, mm. I am really mourning the sixth extinction. I am really right. mourning um, knowing that certain things won't be there for my great grandchildren, but there will be new things. There will be different things. But so for me, it's I've, I've been having all these animal dreams ever since I got back from back home, mm. sort of, of of animals that may not be here anymore. And so for me, it's like I just write little stories about them and mm. you know and I and I think about how can I turn that into something creative how can I so I think the balance of what we mourn or or you know facing our fear and then t shifting the energy but that you know we're going to have I think this mix of in quiet moments like a little bit of overwhelm or grief. Well, we, and then you can't, you cannot but have the gamut of emotions, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the and that's grief just, and fear is going to be there. Yeah, but we don't want to live there. Right. We don't want to hang out there. You have to acknowledge but it. See, you I, have to go through the yeah. grieving process, and then you have to move on. See, I don't think of it as a separate place. I think it's mm -hmm. all there in the same place. I don't think you go to fear or you go mm -hmm. to grief. It all resides within us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's sure. what you want to hang out with and where you want to put your energy. But see, I feel like, just to be frank, um, that when you, I, I know what it's like when I've gone through depressions and certain people are like, well, you know, Snap pe out of people it. really get <laughs> upset about it. Think and it's like, no, you have to live in that place with the other things. So I don't see it as, as I go somewhere and then I come back. I see it as a, it's this whole landscape inside of me. Sure. And, and in that landscape, there's this one hell hole and, and, mm -hmm. and there's the other. But, but it's all my landscape. So mm -hmm. on my landscape, I've got a septic tank. I've got it, you know, so I kind of look at it as. It's all part of me. Sure. But the, the overarching thing is to to not ever let anything get out of balance. Well, you know, that reminds me of murder, the, the example, but it was um, 
a uh, Native American wise man, I cannot remember who said this, but he's talking to his grandchild, and he's talking, and they're having a discussion about, you know, the horrible in life and the great in life, and one is like a monster and one is like an angel. Or two wolves. Ones. One's two a, wolves. One's a, and, a, a horrible mean wolf, yes. and the other's a nice wolf. And at the, you know, and the grandfather explains which what the mean wolf does and what the kind uh, wolf <clears> does, <throat> and when the uh, grandson says, "Well, uh, which one wins?" and the grandfather says, "The one that you feed." And that's what hmm. I mean. It isn't uh-huh. yeah. that you don't have all of these yeah. things. It's where do you focus your attention? It's not like yeah. you suppress because what, yeah. you, what you resist persists. Yeah. You have to acknowledge it and deal with it. But it's where you want to focus your energy. Right. So, And we were talking about this last week with grief and fear. And, uh, and somebody, I forget who it was, so maybe it was Charles, uh, said that, well, grief is just, it just shuts you down. Uh, and it's narcissistic, uh, yeah. but it also shuts you down. Or it can shut you down, right? So can, op- so can wishful thinking, you know, optimism, bad optimism. Or magical let's put it that thinking. Way. Magical yeah. thinking will shut you down because you don't have to do anything if God's going to fix everything anyway. Mm-hmm. Or, you know. See, I think that intelligent we're intelligent space beings are going to come and fix anything everywhere, everything anyway. You don't have to do anything about anything. Well, well to and me, as a culture, don't you think that we have a problem that we Americans, particularly as a culture, hmm. it's like grief is a bad thing. You know, sadness and mourning is a bad thing. Hmm. We don't hold a space for it. And if you look at most indigenous cultures, there is this time that you, you your time in the cave, your time in the dark that you go, and that's where you go, and you come back out of it mm-hmm. with a, a, a depth and a, an appropriate time. You know, mourning is actually a physiological process. Mm-hmm. When you, I was working on a series uh, called Dying Back Home about the difference between grief and dying and death in the South, mm. the old, you know, rural sort of South. And, you know, there were books written on etiquette for what a grieving person is going to and what kind of food to serve them, what their bodies can die. I mean, it was a whole book of etiquette I found from like 1840 that was talking about the grieving person. Sometimes their hands will get cold. They Mm. talked about the first few weeks of grieving, what a person physically goes through. And I thought, we don't really... First of all, everything's going so fast, we don't really have time to grieve and yeah, mourn. Right. <laughs> and we don't have ritual or much ritual at all around right. grieving and mourning. Right. So we have to learn how to sort of weave it in because in our culture, we have to keep moving, keep going. So that could generate a false optimism when you're, you know, I don't want to grieve, therefore I'm going to be happy and everything's going to be fine. And I don't have to think about that now. I'll well, think about that what, later. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> I'll think about that tomorrow. Well, you know, this is again. I'm going to bring back Paul, uh, Paul's new book, Project Drawdown, because um, you know, again, he's thinking globally, working locally, and connecting the dots. And among the 20 solutions, 10 of them involve land use and food. Mm. Another 20 of the solutions are coming attractions, things already in place that are making an impact for the better or have the potential to do so. Mm. The project is also creating a carbon council comprised of companies and organizations committed to reducing climate change. So from um, renewable energy to land use to educating girls and in other countries, uh, possibly the greatest part of the project is that it produces 100 no regret solutions. This is hope. This is mm. practical information. He's very, very practical, Paul. Mm. And he, so many of these things are in place. And what he's saying, we can't just keep talking about the same old solutions. We have to come up with a new paradigm. Mm. And that's what he's done. Uh, yeah, so he's talking about existing. So I think there's the, the, the danger, of course, is the is the hope that someone's going to find the techno fix for everything. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's like that's like magical thinking. Yeah, no, no, that's he, like he, that's he, like God thinking. You know, he, God no, will fix it, or some some clever guy will fix it. But he, he's weaving he's, together stuff. Yes, and that's he's already talking about there. The, that building community is right. a major major part of it. Right. That all of these projects or many of these projects have nothing to do with technology mm. as much as people's creativity and what they're doing in the community uh, globally. Excellent. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's a very positive thing. Give us a call, 415-663-8492, and uh, tell us why you have hope if you do. And this is KWMR <laughs> Community Radio for West Marin, 90.5 and Point Ray Station, 89.9 
in Bolinas and 92.3 in the San Geronimo Valley. And we're streaming live on kwmr.org. We'd like to thank our underwriters again. Programming on KWMR is brought to you by the Maritime Radio Historical Society, working to preserve West Marin's rich radio heritage. The nation's last working Morse Code Coast Station is in action every Saturday from 12 to 4 p.m. at the RCA receiver site. 17400 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, just past G Ranch on the Point Reyes Peninsula. Information at 415-663-8982. Or online at radiomarine.org. That's radio, M A R I N E, dot org. KWMR is also supported by Web Perception, an internet service provider providing West Marin businesses and individuals with internet connection services, serving West Marin and the entire Bay Area since 1997, and offering professional installations usually within five to seven days. Information at 415 892 7711 or online at Web perception.com and you're listening to let's talk radio with co-hosts paul rafael robin carpenter and i'm mary frank please share your views by calling 415-663-8492 or tweet us at let's talk on kwmr yes tweet us yes. Rachel. and today we're asking what makes you optimism what Optimistic. What gives you optimism uh, in the face of so many changes and daunting things such as climate change? Do call in, and when you hear me say you're on the air, give us your first name, turn down your radio, and please watch your language. And I, I do want to say that I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to put down people who draw their optimism, their hope from, uh, from religion. I mean, if that's what helps people through and it make, gives them a reason to carry on and uh, hope for the future, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, I was listening to KWMR this morning, of course, over breakfast. And, <laughs> uh, and Susan Santiago had a guest. Uh, I think her name was Ardella, maybe. Uh, she was talking about pan uh, which is uh, basically dance. It's uh, something to do with the cosmic vibes, and we're dancing the cosmic vibrations, and uh, we're laying the foundation for the development of the sixth race, which is because, you know, the age of Aquarius is coming, uh, that everything's going to change, and this will be the sixth race of humanity, apparently, which uh, panurythmy is helping to manifest. So, you know... You hey, know, it's really interesting. I, I, I probably give no credence to that, but I think it's a wonderful thing if that's what if that's what gives people the the urge to uh, carry on, gives them hope for the future. What's wrong with dancing about mm-hmm. it? That's what I think. Mm-hmm. But Paul, and I think stick about to beat the, the devil. <laughs> um, if I think about the work that you and Donna did, as far as like global orgasm and that ah. kind of work, is you know I think all religion and. Um, things like that at their core rise up from the need for us to connect to things that are unseen. Mm. So the actual vibration created when you have uh, hopefully everybody on earth on the same day having an orgasm (laughs) or wonderful naked women spelling out peace on the beach here or, you know, that that we are looking for it in different ways. So maybe for a friend of mine who's Catholic and what they get out of going to mass and the ritual there, mm. they're still seeking the same thing I'm doing if I'm standing out naked in my garden at midnight on the solstice. Good the, heavens, that with, was you. With my feet. <laughs> I know. Everybody called up and said, Robin, we can see you. But, you know, I think that we're all craving. I think we, most of us, whether we're religious or not, Mm-hmm. can say that there is definitely their energetic vibrations that that we can tap into with each mm-hmm. other within ourselves with the planet with the earth that is one of the things that has come up around um people are sensing theoretically especially if you're a pantheist you're sensing the shift on the planet and you're sensing actual you know grief and shift and change mm. of the planet itself sometimes when you connect so there's i so i think that being connected to others and other energies, it is optimistic because we think, oh, if there's that unseen thing and we can tap into that and maybe it's more powerful than we really know, mm-hmm. maybe 
our ability to do that is also going to help make things better. I, I would like to take t- a tip of the hat to the global orgasm idea because I have often thought, you know, if there were more orgasms, there would be less war. <laughs> yes, I think I'm a firm said believer that. of that. Uh, yeah, well, that was uh, that was years ago now, and part of the Global Consciousness Project, which was maybe it's uh, time to bring it back. Measuring, Paul. <laughs> yeah, measuring the effects of mass emotional outpourings uh-huh. uh, on what? Well, they don't really know what they were measuring. They had these little computers. Uh, putting out strings of random numbers all around the world. And so things like uh, it was around Princess Di's death, you know, there was a sudden outpouring of grief in places. Mm -hmm. And they noticed that the random numbers became less random, (laughs) became less random, and that the... uh, and that they... The computers that were closer to each other began to actually put out uh, similar strings of of less random numbers. So they were witnessing some kind of change in whatever, you know, we call it the the field or whatever it was, mm-hmm. the, you know. Uh, so there is something there. We, we Global orgasm may have made a difference, but... Uh, but I think it was still that, the whole Certainly made a difference idea. for us. But it looks like we have an invader in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, but are you from the Pleiades here to save us? Oh, the, the Pleiades. Well, is this, is this the astronomy show? I've gotten the wrong one. The, uh, no, I, uh, I, I didn't want this to be dominated by Invernoodles calling in talking about sunsets. So I thought that uh, this is the pessimism show, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> well, it could be. Uh, I, anyhow, the, I, I just went on a, a canoe trip uh, just uh, about 10 minutes ago. It was terrible, hmm. uh, uninspiring. Uh, let's see. I've got a, a call later with a young man uh, in Ashland, Oregon, who works at the utility there, who wants to do more with solar. And I said, what's the point? Uh, you know, I mean, it's, what, is, what is all this happiness? But, yes, I, I was, I'm house-sitting here and. Point raise, and uh, and I decided to crash your show. So. Ah, I see. <laughs> so, what do you think about optimism? Is it worthwhile? I mean, you must be optimistic that the work you're doing with uh, local power must be uh, is going to make a difference of some kind. I think it's more idealistic. I don't know if I'd use the word optimistic, and I, I put it in the paper, which is um, read uh, by my mother, I believe, um, and uh, uh, that uh, that old line from the Italian communist Antonio Gramsci that you have to the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will, which you have to know that things are not working out, uh, but want to try and do something anyway. But Mm. that is not precisely optimism. I think it's idealism. And I think actually cynicism is what we, when people say, you know, this is optimistic behavior, I think it's actually often cynical, which is the cynic throughout the ages just attunes themselves to the conditions of the society in which they live. And they appear to be very well adjusted and happy, but I think actually they've given up hope. Well, that's talking. We're talking about optimism without uh, without action. Optimism or magical thinking without uh, without any realism entering into it. Yeah, I think magical thinking is, would be a good way of putting it. But you mm. couldn't engage in that kind of thinking without a certain level of cynicism, um, mm. because I think the people that have made a false sort of uh, yeah. idol out of nature or false idol out of uh, happiness and enjoyment and experience, they do it on some level, maybe unconscious, is a response to, you know, just how uh, dark um, the world can be sometimes and how, mm. and how frightening. So I think that it can be fear sometimes that drives us a, this uh, apparent optimism, which is more maniacal, I think. Creates the other side. It's people being manic. Um, you know. Melinda Lighthold wrote in and said, optimism is a gut feeling. It's not qualified by any of the above-mentioned possibilities, which was about religion or intergalactic beings. Or uh, <laughs> For me, it's about the connection with the natural world and life as it persists, a kind of joy about it, a felt thing. There you go. That was very nice. Lovely, Belinda. And, uh, and Stevie Hurwitz could not uh, actually wrote this after the show last week because he was driving while the show was on. Uh, and he says... Uh, Enough of the bad stuff. I am of the belief that the best position to take is to do what makes you feel good. Now. <laughs> that's, what is that, Gaddafi's law? Um, I, I think that's Stevie's law. <laughs> if fighting the good fight makes you feel good, then by all means do it. If denying the problem altogether does it, okay. Whatever makes you feel good. Ignoring the iceless polar bear is most common. Of course, there's money to be made. Ah, well. The Dr. Steve Westheimer has uh, suggested if it feels good, do it. Um... 
And Elizabeth Whitney wrote in the Point Raised Light, which I got online this morning, finding an inner place of composure is how to survive in reactionary times. That's the place of soul nourishment that puts us in tune with time, which is where synchronicity takes place, and we control that. Emotions find their proper role, which are to guide us to compassion and connection with others, no matter how they behave. I love Leading that. From the I, heart. I, I that's like very that. good. Ah, uh, Elizabeth, she is. And it gives, it gives you, it's empowering as well. Right. You know, it's interesting because um, speaking back about global orgasm and when I first met Donna and Paul, mm-hmm. and I was in the middle of my third big activist project and about to have my butt kicked again, as has happened in almost every activist project I've mm. ever worked on. There's a pattern. But, but learning about, you know, we were talking about what does it mean to be an activist and what is the right mindset? Because in being an activist, you're expressing optimism that you can change something that you believe needs to be changed. And I remember Donna saying to me, you know, you have to keep your ego out of it because... Mm-hmm. If we're chipping, let's just say we're chipping away at a horrible wall that needs to come down. You know, you stand and you chip your piece. Hmm. And it may be your granddaughter that finally gets to be at the place where the hole goes through. (laughs) You know, so great point. So you can't have this thing of like, because Donna was saying, you keep saying, well, I keep getting my, you know, fanny kicked. And I keep, Hmm. you know, and it was like, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's about your belief that this is important to Mm -hmm. do something about. And the win may not come on your watch. Right. You know, and so uh, that's so that to me that was asking myself and my own will to be optimistic and to Mm -hmm. set my ego aside, not take Mm -hmm. it personal and say, do I believe in this cause? Yes or no. And if I do, then 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 I'm going to make steps to change in in steps that I believe are the right direction. Right. The little things that you can do will send ripples or, like you say, chipping away at the wall. Yeah, Yeah, and Donna Donna was wonderful in that she was optimistic all the way to the end. I mean, she had some... Some well, down times, you know, have I really made a difference? In it. But it no, was really it was, important to her. Yeah. And she, one thing I really appreciated when we were talking about balancing light and dark is that Donna went to dark places all the time mm. and, but always believed, you know, we not, we don't stop. We keep trying to make mm-hmm. the changes we mm-hmm. believe are important. We never stop, but sometimes we feel really depressed about it. Sometimes we think we're not doing it correctly, mm-hmm. but we don't, you know, so I always liked that she was very honest about she that because all, it made yeah. me feel okay to have those feelings. She was always looking feelings. for new avenues, new, new the, different She was ways perfect of, for these times right. because these times are of such incredible fast change, and Donna could change on a dime like, <laughs> this is what, I mean, this radio station is here because of Donna. <laughs> you know, we need uh, mainstream media is to cover my ideas. We, we, we're going to create our own media. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that's what I loved about Donna, our too. Our own propaganda our machine. Our own propaganda machine. <laughs> the <Why> counter-propaganda <laughs> machine. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, that wall metaphor, actually, Donna once told me she said I was a partition and she was going to be knocked through. Uh, so I got the other side. Of that. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I, I mean that's that's lovely. That's lovely. But I mean, I was running a separate campaign: global sexual frustration. Um, <laughs> uh, I think you won. <laughs> <laughs> Did you watch the RNC the past few days? You won. Uh, well, I, thank you. It's good little successes that keep you going. You know, keep you optimistic. Anyway, give us a call, 415-663-8492, and uh, come on, be optimistic. Call in. We'll talk to you. We won't we And won't if you're not, you. I'll talk to you. Yes, and you can actually... I, I always stand up for the dark, because you know what? The dark, Maybe also because I'm a night person, and I am sort of a, you know, I don't go to bed till like 3 a.m., you know, uh, and I'm up all night, and I'm really a, in the dark, in the, you know... Um, it's your kind of, that's habitat. my natural habitat in a that's sense. Me. And I think, you know, we always have to have that measure of, you know, both things and, and being able to hold that. The light and the dark. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was lovely to stop in and see you. And I would just say optimism, you know, ultimately, what's the point? I mean, <laughs> um, you know, why? And you and all that solar business. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh my I'm just going to tell that young man, you know, work for Chevron. You want to make some money, kid? Come on. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Good luck. And do call in people. And uh, they'll give out my home phone number. I mean, you can call me as well. There you go. <laughs> thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. He's a desperate man. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, this is KWMR's weekly Let's Talk call-in show with co-host Paul Raffel, Robin Carpenter, and me, Mary Frank. To join our conversation, please call us at 415-663-8492. Yes, do call, please. Come on now. Your voice matters. Uh, so there is such a thing as optimism bias, which is a uh, cognitive bias that leads a person to believe they are less at risk of experiencing a negative event compared to others, which is, uh, Charles has left the studio, uh, smokers, uh, uh, people engaging in dangerous uh, dangerous habits and, and pastimes uh, and don't think that they're going to suffer the consequences of it. Um, Going to, I guess, uh, irrational optimism would be uh, going to the casino or uh, or. Uh, That's almost uh, medic, medic self medication. <laughs> right. I mean, I, it's uh, it's something that, that, and this country is the perfect example of that. That uh, it always amazes me that uh, that working class people you know the backbone mm-hmm. of the of the country who are having a hard time of course because it's all being torn apart by the people that they apparently want to vote for and yet it's based on this american dream thing that anyone can be president and everyone could be a billionaire tomorrow mm. you know i mean it's that it's that's that kind of irrational optimism that's at the back of the american, american psyche. magical thinking right we, we have a caller caller you're on the air what's your name hello Hello. Hello. Who's this? <laughs> it's Ingrid. Hi, Ingrid. Ingrid. So, so what do you think, Ingrid? Are you hopeful? Uh, my name is Ingrid. I'm just, like, having trouble uh, hearing five voices at once. Hmm. I think you have to turn the radio off. Well, then I can't hear you, though. Yes, you can on the phone. Yes, you can. Turn off your radio. Be, be optimistic. We can help you do this. <laughs> okay. We'll talk you through it. There you go. Yeah. Well, I have a funny phone. Okay, so I'm calling in. Yes. Um, I'll tell you what Gandhi said. Ah. Gandhi said what gave him hope was that if you look at history, the good guys do usually win. Ah. And, uh, that's what Gandhi said. I'm not saying I say that. <laughs> well, you know, it may not be exactly when you want or how you want, but I think it's true. If you look, remember, we, we, we didn't, women didn't even get to vote a very short time ago. I mean, there has been progress made. It just may not be in the same time frame uh, you would like. Well, talk about time frame. So the year I was born, uh, I was born right about when Rosa Parks was doing her little sitting mm-hmm. on the bus thing. Mm-hmm. So in my lifetime, we've gone from, from you know, walking up and down the streets of Montgomery to try to get the right to sit where you want to sit on the bus to having a black president. Yeah. yeah. But at the same time. fast progress, really. I mean, mm-hmm. in the scheme of things. And uh, just looking at what's gone on with, for example, gay marriage, which happened a lot faster than I thought it was going to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reached that tipping point, didn't it, Ingrid? It was suddenly, yeah, bam, it shifted. It pretty fast once they get moving in a certain direction. Other things go slower than you want them to, but they, uh, you know, I guess what I'm saying is I've, there, we have a lot of evidence that w- when everything go- starts pushing in a certain direction, it can go pretty fast. Very fast, that's true. So you're you're optimistic about the future because of the. I'm not optimistic about anything. Are you kidding? But I can see that it's possible. Yes. I can see that it's possible. Yeah. I'm very cynical, actually, but I can see what's possible because uh, because we because we have all kinds of evidence that things can change if people decide to make them change. Yeah, that's true. You know, I, I see these times kind of like with the exit of the dragon that uh, people sense. Yeah that there's a huge change going on and the ones that aren't for the changes, it's like the dragon's tail trying to make as much destruction on the way out <laughs> as they can possibly make. But the ones who kind of hold a vision, hold a positive vision, which is maybe the most revolutionary act we can do, con- considering we're all connected, that they can hold strong and move positively through this chaos, which is what we're in the middle of, you know? Yeah. 
No. You know, Ingrid, what you were saying reminds me of I heard Dr. Jane Goodall speaking at Bioneers a couple of years ago, and she talked about and she's really on the front lines of seeing so much devastation with climate change. And she talked about she had great optimism and hope because of the fact that primates and especially human primates, that when we back us up against the wall is when our brilliance comes out. Hmm. There you go. Well, Ingrid, thanks for calling Thank in. You, Ingrid. A little trouble with the phone now. Uh, so, yeah, well, that's that is good. And what you were saying, Mary, is good too. That if you're if if enough people are hanging on to the right thing, to the good thing, the bad guys, the is usually guys, the bad guys will eventually. After all the reactionary stuff, like what's happening now, yeah, we're right in the middle of that. Yeah, thrashing around. <laughs> We got we to gotta stop everyone coming in. And just, yeah, and it's so much based on fear because right. they know the sands are shifting and mm. they don't have the um, mm. wherewithal or the vision or the tools that help them navigate this change. Well, well what, so now there is, is, uh, is the Democratic Party, our liberals, more optimistic than conservatives? Let's put it that way. I would think in some ways that liberals are not because, well, I think conservatives tend currently in our country to have more magical thinking and, mm. and fear-based thinking. Mm. And I, I think, a, a, I won't say liberal so much as a progressive person, that we see problems that we want solved. We, we, we're we're constantly pushing for change for the better, change for the better. Mm. So I don't know if that means we're more optimistic or that we see a vision of how we would like things to improve. Mm. So I, I, in some ways, I think that we're more realistic. I mean, people think of, oh, starry-eyed liberal progressives because mm. I have tons of conservative tons of family arguments. members. But, you know, I think liberal progressives, we're trying to make progress. We're trying to make things better yeah. and to write things that need to be righted. And, and you know, what? Now, compassion is seen as a negative. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's starry-eyed thinking, but really there, you see so much of that that when people um, present compassionate ideas, which is what mm. is so needed right now, it's a put down. It's people have put it down. You know? Well, I don't know. I think people are more and more, especially in face of climate change, realizing we're going to have to come together. We're all in this together. We're all going to get a big bad spanking together. So I think it kind of shifts. It was really interesting last night because I did watch, you know, the RNC, the whole convention, because I always try to watch everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I the left, the right, the center, mm -hmm. um, because I feel like oftentimes and I watch Fox and I watch MSNBC I watch CNN because I want to because I want to know how my sure. brothers and sisters who believe very differently from me why and what they're thinking but someone made a statement about you know we have to accept Donald Trump because he's what the people want and instead of saying our party's divided our party has been awakened to the people don't want the establishment anymore and they're sick of how it's going and they want something different yeah, so you may not you may not like Trump, and so in the same speech at the RNC convention, mm -hmm. he says, you see it in the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. how all, all these people wanted Bernie Sanders. The people are telling all of us enough with the establishment. And he said, so the Democratic Party may look united, but they're serving up a great big plate of establishment. <laughs> and we may look divided, but we're serving up, whether we like it or not, something with, that the people demanded. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting, too, like... To hear someone, I normally think, oh, God, and, you know, each time someone would come up to speak, whether it was a wrestler mm -hmm. or a soap star growing figs or <laughs> avocados or whatever, um, which, you know, I can make fun of, but I can also totally make fun of what we'll probably end up doing. But it was really interesting to hear. I'm hearing dialogue of people who are waking up that are very conservative going, you know, look, the establishment, you know, people are sick of it. Whether, the, you know, Trump mm, supporters right. and Bernie supporters are not that different at their core. And they're all optimistic that if we could just break something loose, things will be better. The and, revolution is coming. Maybe. Of some kind. <laughs> and uh, we'll make America great again. That's the that's the great uh, rallying cry, right? And it's the... Uh, it was interesting. Like it isn't great. There were a lot of people being interviewed by the different networks outside the convention asking about what they thought about 
make America great. And that, I did not hear one person, say, almost everybody said, well, I don't think that's really the issue. Hmm. The issue is make America safe or make America safe. economically viable. Or make, So I thought it was interesting that people didn't quite like the phrase make America great, but they were telling, and almost always it was something emotional or based around fear, mm-hmm. make America economically healthy again, make America safe. Make a, So they were expressing what they're concerned about. And I thought that was interesting that they weren't quite buying into generic Make America Great. Right. Everybody was sort of saying, I want to make it safe. I don't feel like it's safe for my kids, whether it's transgender bathrooms well, or yeah, whether right. it's wars, constant war. So <laughs> anyway, once again, I think at the heart of it, all humans do want the same things. Yeah. You know, we mm-hmm. want to keep living and thriving as we want you to have children to have we, a good life. And we want mm-hmm. to, you know, pa- you know, it's hardwired into our DNA to pass on knowledge and, and, and DNA. Sure. And uh, have a good life of children having a good life. It used to be in this country that your children, you wouldn't, they wouldn't just have a good life. They'd have a better life than yours. Yeah. Is, do you think that's still No, this possible? is the first generation. Let's just talk about ah. health here. This is the first generation that will not live as long as their parents. So that is a real step yeah. back. Wow. Yeah. The health crisis is that. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. sure. Look at the, look the, what the young kids are, are dealing with in terms of toxicity, in yes, terms of vaccinations. Studies have shown that the life this expectancy is, will be down by yeah, about five first, years. First time this has ever happened. So that's a wake-up no call. No kidding. That's a huge. I did let's not just, know that. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're a generation that were, you know, even moms like me who were all organic or whatever, they tested breast milk of women in North America, and everybody, whether they were organic or not, had glyphosate in their breast milk. Glyphosate and jet fuel. And jet fuel. And so and, are the wines and, in Marin Co- in uh, the sure. wine country. Yeah. Sure. So, you know, they're a generation that's been raised with things that, you know, th- those things weren't in our parents' food supply mm. when we were coming along. And so they've, you know, no matter how much you try to protect, you can't, you know, things are in the air, things are in the food. And then kids born in the past 18 years have been eating GMOs, mm. which is a whole new experiment yeah. on our children. And mm. and Dr. Michelle Perro, who we all know, has done wonderful work with the anti-GMO movement. So it's uh, hard to feel optimistic, isn't it? For well, parents, not really, as parents because I think, or it's, as I, think grandparents? It, I think it's, I think it's a wake up call. I think that uh, this may be the it's like blessed unrest. This mm-hmm. may be the very thing that will bring people together because no matter what your political beliefs are, everybody wants their kids to be okay. If your children are dying young, yeah, it may be a catalyst for action. Yeah. Well, one of the things that happened with the it GMO, will be. with it the will be. with the GMO movement, Pam Larry, who was a grandmother living in Chico woke up one morning she'd become very depressed about what she was seeing happening to our food supply and that at that point in time when I first met Pam no one was covering GMOs when I would tell people I'm writing and researching GMOs they thought I was talking about cars and so (laughs) Pam woke up in just this she woke up one morning and just the anxiety and depression and got to her and she said that's it I'm gonna I'm going to make this, I'm going to change this. And she started the Prop 37 label GMO movement here in California. Mm. And what was very interesting was the GMO sort of, you know, the non-GMO project and the, the people in sort of the liberal progressive world fighting against GMOs were really upset because they had a plan and they didn't think yeah. people were ready yet. And then you have somebody grassroots going rogue on you mm. trying to get a vote and they're like, oh no, it's going to blow it all up or whatever. She went out and she all she knew was this was a mom's grandmother's issue. And she had, by the time we were going to vote, she had almost every tea party uh, mm. you know, uh, advocating for the law. She had Republican Women's Caucus. She had Democrat. She had everybody on board mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. it's an across the board issue. Hmm. Now, what really sank Prop Thirty Seven was not Monsanto putting the money in. It was when the Democratic operatives and the professionals came in and took it away from the grassroots and started offending the Tea Party alliances we had and the Republican Women's alliances we had, and they they alienated a lot of the people that we had worked really hard so that this was a nonpartisan issue. Hmm. And that's where I really saw, really saw where the two-party system is so broken. It, not broken. It is so toxic right. and limited. to it's progress. Limiting. And no you had compromise. this 
in in the issue of food and health and and envi- there's a new a moms air force is what it's called moms clean air force hmm. another group so you have these amazing like main street moms and these moms hmm. groups that they don't it doesn't matter you you find everybody republican democrat right. trump supporter yeah. jill stein supporter so though we do have i'm seeing these issues are really bringing people together as mary was saying hmm, good well, that's good. That's a, that's hopeful for the future. That there's that. So it's crisis grassroot, and bad news can action make things. Where well, it's when, a wake up call when it starts having, affecting you or your children. Yeah. Then I mean that people who never even think about that. When you see your kids right. getting sick, you will rally. Well, most. What was her name? Erin Brockovich, right? Oh yeah, she was, yeah. she's still doing it's, amazing yeah. work now on water, on clean water. Right. Yeah, yeah. I do want to. I just want to say one thing about the Monsanto labeling. I do think the fact that Monsanto was spelling, spending a million dollars a week in California to not let it had an influence it had so you don't think so no 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 it really? was it was I was in, on the inside yeah. and watched some of the things that were done and losing you know we were going to be speaking at the California Republican Convention yes. and mm. our Democratic operative was like we don't need those people and wow. sent out a nasty email and there we were yeah, and then wow. and, and we were going to get the uh, endorsement of the Republican Women's Caucus and we thought possibly the endorsement of the Republicans and because of that acting out and we don't need those stupid Republicans, we the coalition fell uh, apart. The, no, no. Well, we lo- we lost a lot of numbers. If you sure. had both the Democratic Party and the Republican yeah. Party endorsing it, it would have won. It wouldn't matter how much money Monsanto yeah. spent. Yeah. Well, so that that's my take from watching it. But, yeah, the original was was uh, was a good a good coalition of everybody. Yeah, and that's what it's going to take. That's exactly what it's going to take. Uh, well, yeah. I want to. Thank everyone who called in. Uh, thank you, Ingrid, and uh, <laughs> Charles for coming in, and everyone who wrote. I mean, we get emails every week, which is a wonderful thing. So people are actually responding. Uh, do call in next week when we will be discussing. What are we discussing oh, next yeah, week? Oh, yeah, next week we'll be discussing fruitful aging, how to find the gold in the golden years, <laughs> how to navigate the changes and challenges of fruitful aging, for yourself, a parent, or a loved one. We'll be discussing um, creative approaches for harvesting the labor and lessons of a lifetime. We'll be diving deep into exploring the universe within that leads to the way of revisiting what it means to be not only mature in in years, but golden. And I just want to add a little quote by Emily Dickinson about hope. Hmm. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And by the way, KWMR does not take a stand on any of the issues discussed on Let's Talk. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the hosts and callers and don't necessarily reflect the views of KWMR, its board of directors, underwriters, or members. This has been Let's Talk on KWMR with your hosts Paul Raffel, Mary Frank, and I'm Robin Carpenter.